what do you want to be when you grow up? It was a question that every one of us has been asked at one point or another in our lives. And it's a question that we've all had an answer to and thought about ever since we were old enough to understand that one day we would have to grow up and actually be something. And if you're a parent, it's possible that you have asked your own children that question. And what you may notice is that when children answer that question, and when we answer that question as children, our answers weren't dictated by fear or safety or security or comfort or the size of a paycheck or what looked or sounded good on a resume, but our answers were dictated entirely by imagination and possibility. We wanted to be firemen and astronauts and ballerinas and rock stars and explorers. And I even asked friends on Facebook this question of what they wanted to be when they grew up, and their answers ranged from ambitious and awe-inspiring to, in many cases, really kind of out there. The first female president, a ghostbuster, a pro wrestler, a comic book artist, a spy, a member of the Partridge family, <laughs> And my personal fantasy that I would one day wake up and discover that I had not in fact been born to my wonderful Indian parents, but had been sent to them from the planet Krypton <laughs> and had superpowers, a delusion fortunately for them that I eventually grew out of. But it was a time in our lives when life was an untold story waiting to be written, a blank canvas, and the set of possibilities for what we could become just seemed infinite. So what happened? What changed between then and now? I believe that we learn one thing throughout the course of our lives that rather than expanding our sense of possibility significantly limits it. And today I wanna to talk about what that is. In the fall of 1996, I started college at UC Berkeley and I wanted to be an English major and I wanted to be a writer. And it was something that I wanted to be ever since I read The Great Gatsby in high school and learned that F. Scott Fitzgerald's first book, This Side of Paradise, was actually based on his undergraduate experience as a student at Princeton. My favorite class was this freshman seminar on war and literature, and it was taught by a former editor of a major newspaper who was a visiting professor at Berkeley that semester. And his office was in the Berkeley School of Graduate Journalism, which is this building right here, and it was one of the most beautiful buildings on campus you walked in and it was the kind of building where you thought to yourself, this is the kind of place where books were meant to be written and art was meant to be created. A Couple of weeks after school started, a friend from high school and I were walking through campus and we stumbled into a career fair where I had a chance to speak briefly with a recruiter from a company that at the time was called Anderson Consulting and today you know as Accenture. A couple of minutes into our conversation, he was kind enough to inform me that they didn't really hire a lot of English majors. After that semester, I never took another English class outside of what was required to graduate, and to the best of my knowledge, I never set foot in the School of Journalism again. And to this day, I've never once applied for a job at Accenture or even been interviewed for a job at Accenture. And I've thought a lot about why that is. Why is it that that one conversation could lead to so much unmet potential and so many missed opportunities? As we get older in our lives, what happens is that our answers to this question of what do you want to do or what do you want to be are no longer dictated by imagination and possibility, but instead they're dictated by fear, by hesitation, by self-doubt, and by the expectations of society's life plan. Stick to straight and narrow, well-lit paths. Follow all of the rules. Don't make too much of a ruckus. Obey your elders. And climb the corporate ladder. And it's not necessarily that these are terrible choices that lead to a bad life. It's just that they offer us an incredibly limited perspective. And what happens is that we end up seeing the world through a certain lens and we start to intertwine this question of what it is that we want to do or what it is that we want to be with something that I think is a much more profound and expansive and powerful question and that's the question of what is actually possible. For the last seven years, I've been using the internet to make things, to connect people, to share ideas and to tell stories. And the primary way that I've done that is through a project called The Unmistakable Creative, where I seek out people that I find insanely interesting. People who I'm morbidly curious about, and people who, above all things, stand out in an incredibly distinctive way. 
like this guy, who robbed 30 banks in two years, <laughs> spent seven years in prison, got out of prison, wrote a book about it, became a talking head on the criminal justice system, and mentored Piper Kerman, who wrote Orange is the New Black, while she was serving her sentence. Or this guy, who in 2011 walked out of his door with $10, a laptop, and three goals, to work one-on-one -on -one with 500 people, to start a business in an industry he knew nothing about, and to visit all 50 states. With the only caveat being that the only two resources that he could use to accomplish those three goals were the $10 and the laptop. I ended up being one of those 500 people. He was the one who actually came up with the name, Unmistakable Creative, and if you happen to be a fan of the TV show 24, I refer to him as the Jack Bauer of the internet because I'm quite sure he could defuse a nuclear bomb in a day. <laughs> or this woman, who decided to cook a meal from every country in the world and document the experience on her blog, and in the process ended up discovering a vibrant international community in a place that we may not necessarily think of as being known for its ethnic diversity, Tulsa, Oklahoma. And if there's anything that has become apparent to me through these and the hundreds of other stories that I have been exposed to as a result of this project, it's that the human capacity for creativity and self-expression is not only extraordinary, it's limitless. And it's something that we all possess, but at a certain point in our lives, it stops being nurtured. I believe that deep down we have, all of us have these creative impulses, these moments when we want to see something exist in the world, but often the stories that we tell ourselves about what we think is actually possible with our lives and our careers are all inhibited by one emotion, and that's fear. Fear that maybe if we start writing, nobody will read our writing. Fear that if we start selling our products, nobody will buy them. Fear that if we start a company, it will completely bomb. Fear that we'll completely fail. Fear that even if we do get what we want, it won't make us happy. But what's interesting about all of these fears is that they're the result of one other underlying fear that drives so much of our behavior. And that is, of course, the fear that maybe we'll be wrong. And the fear of being wrong is not something that's natural, it's something that's learned. It goes all the way back to when we were sitting in school, raising our hands when we had the right answers, keeping quiet when we had the wrong ones, and God forbid that you think you have the right one and raise your hand to discover that you have the wrong one, the whole class laughs, your fear of being wrong gets reinforced, and the lesson becomes don't take any chances, don't speak up, and keep quiet. And in school, the consequences of being wrong are not so severe. Maybe you get bad grades, not the end of the world. But then what happens is we take this fear of being wrong and we carry it into our adult lives and our work where the consequences maybe are more severe, like getting fired. But if all of our creative impulses, the chances that we take and the choices that we're willing to make are dictated by this fear of being wrong, then all we'll see and all we'll be willing to consider are the options that we see in front of us. And for what it's worth, it might help you to know that throughout history, some of the most iconic creators have all had people who thought they were wrong. All you have to do is go to Amazon and look at the one-star reviews of some classic literature. One out of five stars, this book was such crap, a giant steaming pile of crap, the catcher in the rye. The most meaningless book I've ever read, they're making a movie about this, The Great Gatsby. Hemingway must have bribed his publisher to get this book to print. The fear of being wrong is one of the greatest inhibitors of possibility in our lives, yet it drives so much of what we do and what we're willing to try and what we're willing to attempt. But it's only in our willingness to be wrong that really interesting, innovative, and creative work actually occurs. And there's this really interesting relationship between risk and fear that either nobody tells us about or we completely forget as we get older, and that is that risk, when it works in our favor, has the power to transform fear into fuel and anxiety into joy. And I actually learned this in the most unexpected of places. In parallel to this seven-year journey of using the internet to make things, I began another one as an avid surfer. I caught a wave on a beach in Brazil at the tail end of a semester abroad, and when I got back to Pepperdine University in Malibu for the final semester of my MBA, and I got my financial aid check, instead of going to the bookstore, I went to the surf shop, and I bought a board and a wetsuit. <laughs> I graduated in April 2009, and along with most of my class, I didn't have a job lined up because it was a terrible time to graduate, and after a few weeks, I quickly figured out that surfing is a fantastic hobby for an unemployed person because it takes up a ton of time 
and it doesn't cost any money. <laughs> Fast forward to 2010, I finally managed to get myself a job, but I'm surfing so much that one day I get out of the water in San Onofre, California, and I see this bumper sticker that says, surfing has ruined my life. So I go home and I do a Google search for the bumper sticker, and the second result is my blog. So you're probably wondering what all of this has to do with the fear of being wrong. So in surfing, there's this liminal moment between when you paddle for a wave and when you stand up, known as the drop. And the drop determines what your entire ride will be like. And it's about one thing, commitment. If you hesitate on the drop, you'll either go tumbling down the face of the wave for a wipeout or have a really bumpy ride. The drop is the point of no return, and I think it's a perfect metaphor for risk in our lives. So when you walk out of the door of a safe and secure job with a steady paycheck to pursue a calling, you're in the drop. When you take an investor's money to fund your startup and you know he's expecting a significant return, you're in the drop. When you put down a non-refundable deposit on some crazy ambitious idea or book a one-way ticket to some destination, you're in the drop. And it's this moment that we arrive at over and over and over again in our lives any time that we have the opportunity to take a risk. And when you're standing on the edge of a dream or staring down the face of a wave, it's natural to feel fear, hesitation, doubt, all these things that get in our way. However, the moment that you stand up, the moment that that risk works out in your favor, all of that transforms into pure joy. But here's the thing about the drop. No matter how big or small a wave is, at some point or another, you will inevitably be wrong because it's nature and it's unpredictable. The only way not to be wrong is to let waves keep passing you by. And the same occurs in our lives. The only way to avoid being wrong is not to take any chances at all. Now, change in our lives doesn't have to occur by taking some sort of gargantuan, death-defying, reckless risk where you come out of the other side of it alive. That's not at all what I'm encouraging here. But every small risk, every small wave prepares us for a bigger one. It's the sum total of our ongoing efforts to make change in our lives that result in the change that we're seeking to make. So take that guitar lesson that you've been thinking about for the last five years. Write that thing that you're afraid to write but might end up making a profound difference for somebody who reads it. Hang your photos or your paintings in a gallery or a space of some sort and invite your closest friends to come see them. Enroll in that cooking class you've been thinking about. As long as the downside isn't jail time, bankruptcy, <laughs> or death, the consequences of the chances that we take are almost as, never as grave as we imagine them to be in our heads. Right now, we're living both in a time of profound uncertainty and one of the greatest times in history to be a creative professional. We have more access to resources, tools, and distribution channels than we've ever had. Don't waste this opportunity and don't deny the world the gift that you might possess just because you're afraid that you might be wrong. Fear is always going to be part of our lives and our work. And if there's anything that the last seven years of being both a surfer and a writer have taught me, it's that fear only diminishes after we commit to whatever it is that we're afraid of. So what do you want to be when you grow up? Maybe it's not too late. Maybe you'll be wrong. Or maybe you'll catch a perfect wave and end up on the ride of your life. Thanks.